I thought I'd share with you something that's occurred to me over the weekend that I've been wrestling with um, in terms of a book that I've been reading. And what I want to do is just to give you a Greek verse that really stems from everything in respect to this problem. In a way, I've wrestled with this problem for a long, long time. And I'll give it to you. Um, and maybe you can uh, shed some light on it for me. I want to read to you from Galatians chapter 2, verse 19 where Paul writes there, um, Ego ga dia nomu nomo apithanon hina theo zeso Christo sonistarome. Uh, you could see, uh, it's fairly easy to translate there. You've got the first person pronoun, uh, ego, um, I, uh, the connective that never occurs first in the sentence, ga, for I. And then let's just take it uh, literally as we go across, we say, we can see where the main verb is there. It's, uh, it looks like a secondarist form. It's from apathnesco, um, I, uh, to die. Um, and here it's, uh, you can see where the, <coughs> it's a secondarist form. In other words, it takes the endings of the imperfect and it's got the augment in there, apo, uh, that's lengthened to, uh, an, with the augment to an epsilon. And then the stem there is uh, changed. So it's a second aorist form. Uh, meaning um, what? Uh, well, let's take the whole thing with the uh, two uh, phrases there, dia nomu, uh, dia is that preposition, it means, as you know, because of with the accusative or through with the genitive. So here with the genitive, uh, nomu, which is a, uh, a <coughs> second declension masculine noun, nomos, law. So uh, literally for I, through the law, uh, and then uh, nomu again, but this time in uh, what dative masculine singular, so it's probably going to be an indirect object of the verb because the verb is first person um, singular of a secondary form, apothnesco. So for I, uh, through the law, and I'm going to put uh, nomo then after the verb, I died, um, for through the law, I died by the law, indirect object. Uh, and then uh, in a clause, which will introduce a subjunctive, subjunctive in terms of uh, um, uh, causal or consequence. Um, uh, in a, um, uh, that or so that, and then zeo um, from uh, I live, this is going to be um, future. And yet it's a future um, subjunctive. Uh, suggesting uh, that it's not yet occurred and it's going to occur in the future rather than it being simply the future indicative so that I will live for God. Uh, theo, theos, here, dative masculine singular. So it's so that uh, I may live for God. Uh, and then and then we have this, um, again, it looks like indirect object from Christos, Christo, dative masculine singular, and this is the verb that I want to really concentrate upon here. As you can see, um, literally, uh, staro'o is I crucify. It's a verb that stems, ends in an uh, omicron. So here, it's the stem is lengthened. And you look and you see that the um, prefix on it, sun, which is a, a preposition that means with, here then there's the, an augment that's, that's put between the um, preposition the prefix and the verbal stem itself. So it's, um, uh, it, uh, I am crucified with. Uh, and literally then, then what is it as, as a tense? Ah, that, that, that my at the end would tell you that it's perfect. It's not perfect active. There's no kappa in there, so it must be perfect, perfect active, perfect passive. So therefore it's, uh, I have been. In other words, something that happened to me in the past whose effects are working through the present of where I am now. I have been crucified, Christo, with Christ. For I um, have died, or I died to the law, or through the law, or by the law, so that I may live uh, for God. I have been crucified um, with Christ. Now, the, the verb crucify there is the one that I'm really thinking about, because that, to me, is the essence of what it means to be a Christian. I connect that with um, Romans 6, 
from the standpoint of it. I'm not just seeing it as a metaphor of saying that we uh, crucify daily, uh, as in um, Luke 9.27, where Luke says that uh, we are to take up our cross daily, as opposed to in Mark's Gospel, in Mark chapter 8, the, the <coughs> daily is not there, the adverb is not there whatsoever. So that could be, uh, it, it, well, scholars tend to interpret that literally in the sense that it could have meant if Rome was the origin of uh, Mark's Gospel in the 60s or Syria Palestine in the late 60s, then the idea and the notion of being crucified could have been a literal occurrence, whereas the idea with what Luke uh, uh, puts in the notion daily in verse 27 of chapter 9, it's, it's sort of metaphorical, man. We crucify ourselves daily as we live for Christ. In a sense, it's much more oriented towards uh, seeing it as a, a picture or an image of what happens to us as we seek to uh, live for Christ each day. And so uh, from that standpoint then, um, I'm, I'm looking at this passage in Galatians 2, verse 19, in terms of I've been crucified with Christ as an identification with Christ, as in baptism, in, in an, uh, especially in, I think it's verse 4 in Romans 6, which says, for I, I, uh, I have been buried with Christ. I'm buried. In other words, it's the crucifixion that occurs, and then and then I come out of that crucifixion, and I live that way. You could look at Galatians 5:24 in a similar sense. Um, whether it's that specifically tied to baptism, or whether it's a metaphor in the sense of since the beginning of my Christian life, and I take baptism as the sort of the end process of. Um, of conversion from that standpoint, not separated by years and years as in many traditions now, uh, but from a particular book of Acts, it seems to be connected with the actual process of conversion. In other words, it's done immediately as somebody has faith in Jesus Christ. So from that standpoint, I take it with Romans 6, but it could be much more broad than that um, as an indication of what it means to live the Christian life. But the main thing is, what does it stem out? It stems out from a worldview that begins an end, so to speak, with the crucifixion of Jesus. So that the idea of what salvation is, that the focal point of our worldview, of everything that's to follow, comes from the notion of what I'll just simply say is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, identified as the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as it's applied to us. It's quite interesting uh, if you're in a Bible study and you say to somebody, what is the gospel? Uh, I did this a few weeks ago, and I was, I'm, I'm sad to say these were amongst mature Christians, and, and there's a bit of a blank stare. I mean, uh, the obvious answer is, well, it means good news. Okay, what does it mean from there? What, what's the good news? The specificity, specificity of it, that the gospel is actually the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as it applies to us, Romans 15, 1 through 5, is what's need to be noted because that's the, in my view, the foundation, the center point for what it means to be a Christian and that all theology must come out from that. If we, if somebody's preaching and they don't have that theology that's there, what they end up in, to me, is behavioral reductionism. In other words, telling people how to live and what to do that's not that different from some sort of pop psychology book that says this is how you're to live, be humble, be modest, etc. Well, Christianity is not based upon that. It's not an easy behaviorism. It's a process that begins with a theological notion of what it means to identify with Jesus Christ and his death upon the cross. That's why the notion of being crucified is so important. It establishes in our worldviews. Now, I've said all that. That's really a preface to a book that I've been reading. This is the book. It's called... Living Faithful in a Fragmented World by Jonathan Wilson, uh, who teaches at um, Westmont College, I think, uh, in uh, California. And it's really a, a, a sort of a summary of a very deep book that I haven't got myself into yet. I'm not sure how I'm going to do this because um, I think it will, it's very demanding. It's by Alistair McIntyre, a philosopher. Before he became a Christian, it's called After Virtue. And the basic notion of the book is that um, uh, McIntyre takes a look at the um, worldview of the Enlightenment, the progress in terms of seeing authority residing within various forms, i.e. reason, for example, with Kant, in terms of establishing what's the case, as opposed to authorities that comes from the Church, I'm thinking of the Roman Catholic Church, or uh, from Scripture, the Protestant tradition. Um, one of the ways that I try and understand the, um, and explain the Enlightenment in a way which really appeals to me um, is that from a parable of um, uh, Frederick Nietzsche's 
It's called the parable of the gay siren, gay sirens, I believe, or the parable of the madman. And simply put, it describes simply a, a, a man who comes into the market square, a madman, and he's carrying a lantern, and the crowd see him, recognize him for who he is, and they look at him and they start to make fun of him. And they say, hey, uh, what are you doing here? What are you looking for? And the madman looks up at the crowd and says, I'm looking for God. And the crowd just start to laugh to him and say uh, such things as, look, uh, where is he? Has he gone to the bathroom? Uh, is he on a journey? Is he, is he with his parents? Where is he? And the madman becomes perplexed and then gets really angry uh, at the crowd because they don't understand what he's saying. And he looks at them and he says, don't you realize what's happened? I'm looking for God. Don't you realize that we've lost the center of everything, that there's no horizon, that there's no means of establishing what the universe means whatsoever, that we're left to ourselves and all that we can determine within ourselves. And therefore, what it means is that, that I'm looking now to see what life's going to be like for us as we live in this society uh, in terms of without God whatsoever, because God is dead. And the crowd just laugh at him and they don't understand what he's saying. And then the madman in the story throws down his lantern, which smashes, and then just uh, walks away um, in um, in anger and frustration. And it, generally speaking, that parable has been interpreted as the, sort of the the, the a, um, a picture of the rise of secularism in the Enlightenment, where God's no longer needed. In the Middle Ages, uh, the God was the center of society. The priest was the sort of psychologist. But following the Enlightenment, uh, as we know in France, uh, in England, and certainly in the United States, something of Thomas Paine, um, Voltaire, and so forth, that um, what happens is that God then is sort of relegated to the side, so to speak, in terms of the way that society functions. So a worldview comes into existence that's based upon uh, reason. And from that, the church then becomes a sort of a, a side thing, put in a suburb somewhere and so on. And so, I mean, that, that's just a, that's, that's a sort of cursory, because I'm not, I, I'm not a teacher of uh, philosophy in, in depth. I'm just giving you a sort of a, a, um, a, an amateur view of it from that standpoint. But it interests me theologically because um, uh, McIntyre's notion is that the Enlightenment created a, a, a worldview that's now being fragmented. And that worldview is such that um, Christianity has become part of that worldview and fragmented within its base. So that I, I'd just like to read just a little bit from um, the way that Wilson quotes from McIntyre's book, just to show you what this notion of fragmentation is. This is what he says. Imagine that the natural sciences were to suffer the effects of a catastrophe. A series of environmental disasters are blamed by the general public on the scientists. Widespread riots occur. Laboratories are burned down. Physicists are lynched. Books, instruments are destroyed. Finally, a know-nothing political movement takes power and successfully abolishes science teaching in schools and universities, imprisoning and executing the remaining scientists. Later still, there's a reaction against this destructive movement and enlightened people seek to revive science, although they've largely forgotten what it was, but all they possess are fragments, a knowledge of experiments detached from any knowledge of the theoretical context which gave them significance. Parts of theories unrelated either to the other bits and pieces of theory which they possess or to experiment. Instruments whose use has been forgotten. Half chapters from books, single pages from articles, not always fully legible because they're torn and charred. Nonetheless, all these fragments are re-embodied in a set of practices which go under the revived name of physics, chemistry and biology. Adults argue with each other about the respective merits of relativity theory or evolutionary theory and uh, although they possess only a very partial knowledge of each. Children learn by heart the surviving portions of the periodic table and recite as incantations some of the theorems of uh, Euclid. Nobody, or almost nobody, realizes that what they're doing is not natural science in any proper sense at all. For everything that they do and say conforms to certain canons of consistency and coherence, and those contexts which would be needed to understand what they're doing have been lost, perhaps irretrievably. What Wilson brings out with McIntyre, McIntyre's work is that the impact of the worldview, I might say, of the Enlightenment upon Christians has reached a point where Christians are so imbibed within the world of the Enlightenment that they have become fragmented, or we have become fragmented ourselves, 
and we've lost the sense, the, the good sense that comes through Christian history that goes way back to the beginning. The theological ideas that are tied together in such a way that instead of us um, having a, 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 a worldview that's governed by scripture, we're primarily governed by a worldview from the Enlightenment, which has led to fragmentation in so many different areas. Uh, as opposed to pluralism, in other words, pluralism of, say, Baptists and uh, uh, Presbyterians and uh, Orthodox over here and so on, uh, McIntyre interprets it in respect to um, fragmentation. So that, well, if I can just say a generation ago, when I first became a Christian uh, in the early 70s, uh, I would go out and I would argue with different groups of Christians. Uh, I could go and argue with the, the Presbyterians, or I'd go and argue with the Brethren or the Baptists. Um, I knew that there was a certain core group of beliefs that Presbyterians held, uh, which, you know, the acronym TULIP and so forth, um, total depravity, um, unconditional grace, limited atonement, irresistible grace, excuse me, and um, perseverance of the saints. So from that standpoint, then I could understand that and I could uh, argue with them as I understood what their uh, particular worldviews or framework was. But now that's so difficult because you've got, for example, in Chico, you've got the biggest church, which is the Presbyterian church. But I don't think very few, if hardly any, of the twelve to 1,500 people who go to that church are really familiar with the Westminster Confession of 1648 and what it means to be a Presbyterian. Um, many of them wouldn't go along with the notion of, uh, well, I'll put it in common parlance, once saved, always saved. Uh, Presbyterian doctrine that says it's very tightly uh, put together in terms of its logic to me in respect to that if God has put you in a situation where you're saved because you're one of the elect, then you can't fall from grace. That doctrine, that hard sell doctrine is not there in the Presbyterianism that I've experienced from people who go to that church and so on. And that's the one of the points that um, McIntyre is making that's, that um, Wilson brings out into, is in terms of the fragmentation of Christianity according to being really set within the worldview of the Enlightenment and that we've lost our moorings in terms of the deep things of what it means to be a Christian. Uh, for example, one element is, you might say this, the deep things, the foundation element of what I mentioned about the Greek word um, um, uh, apathnesko, in other words, I died to, to Jesus Christ, I uh, died to myself and lived for Jesus Christ according to Galatians 2.19, the very basis of the gospel, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, that's been lost. Uh, for example, you contrast that with uh, Jesus' statement at the end of Matthew in which he says, um, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all, all creation, as opposed to what happened uh, in the post-Constantine post church, which is that Christianity then becomes the basis from which society is orchestrated. And to be a good civil citizen is to be a good Christian within that society. And the uh, advent of Christianity and its growth is based upon the uh, proliferation of those uh, civic-minded Christians where we create a good society, as opposed to that evangelistic norm that was there from the beginning, as I mentioned in Matthew's Gospel. Now, if you put that in that context and then put the Enlightenment there, in which Christians, in a sense, have been, um, uh, all of us have been put through that Enlightenment system of uh, reason in terms of the university structure that we've gone through, then what's happened to our Christianity is we've, we've done the best that we can. And from Wilson's standpoint and, and um, uh, McIntyre's standpoint, it's fragmented. Our, our understanding is fragmented. And, and he draws a, some distinctions that are, are really, really fundamental to me as I look at the what I call a popular church uh, right now, because I'm, I'm struggling to be in it and to be part of it and to know what it means to be a Christian. That's my problem that I've uh, really came out when I was reading this book this weekend. Um, uh, for example, the, um, McIntyre draws a distinction between internal and external uh, benefits, so to speak, in terms of what you think and do. And he gives the example of basketball. So that in basketball, the internal benefit of basketball is uh, camaraderie with someone else, uh, uh, the discipline, the physical discipline, the skills that's required, all that you get within the game. The external benefits of basketball, it could be a way to get into college and so on, or a way of uh, winning a, a tournament and so forth. And so 
um, uh, McIntyre wants to say that the true virtues of Christianity uh, are not found uh, through the fragmentation that's occurred within the Enlightenment, but are found within the deep-seated nature of what it means to be a Christian according to foundational beliefs. So that, um, to, taking a look at the contemporary church, the contemporary church uh, has in many ways uh, tried to find itself within the context of the um, Enlightenment and from McIntyre's standpoint, standpoint it's fragmented. Um, perhaps a good example could be uh, Robert Schuller's notion of self-esteem which became the basis of his preaching in Southern California for a generation that attracted millions of people. Uh, the idea of self-esteem is something that's external to the gospel. It can't be the basis on which we go to worship to get self-esteem. Because in doing that, according to McIntyre, we live in a fragmented world because we're taking fragments now of the Enlightenment in terms of the value of an individual and what that individual means established through reason, uh, psychologically, in terms of one's self-esteem, as opposed to what's the Christian root of worship, so to speak. Um, well, let me give uh, Westminster Catechism. I'm not a Calvinist, but uh, I've always enjoyed that, that our purpose is to enjoy God, to worship God. So therefore, when we go to worship, the criteria of worship is not going to be, is the service constructed in a way that it builds my self-esteem so that I go away from worship each week or whatever, feeling better than I did before I went in there. That's a fragmented view, according to Wilson interpretation according to, to uh, uh, McIntyre. It's a fragmented view because it's not being true to its internal self. It's like basketball and getting external elements that benefit you, like a, um, a place in college through basketball, as opposed to the internal mechanism of what it is, which is the internal mechanism stems down to Galatians 2.19, being crucified with Christ, worshipping God through Christ. These things, then, are the most important things. And I've just brought out one example there. It would be interesting to, to look at so many other elements of how the church functions in respect to its fragmented life, as it really apes the Enlightenment as opposed to being true to its own theological moorings. And maybe the new monasticism, Sean Claiborne and uh, uh, people like that, the, the, the Benedict option, is a way through which Christians are saying, let's stop for a second. Maybe you could take uh, James Davison's Hunters to change the world from uh, his interpretation of, of Jeremiah 29 in respect to this too. Let's stop who we are and find who we are in our own enclaves, not to be monastics, not, not to be separate from the world, that we have nothing to do with it, but to find out what our worldview is so that we can be true to it and not be subsumed among the fragmentation that's occurred uh, from the Enlightenment. So I'm, I'm sort of exploring that a lot as I go to church and see why people do what they do. For example, in Chico, there's 65 to 70 churches, and yet I don't hear hardly, hardly anything about evangelism. There is no evangelism. In my days, by excuse me, in my early days as a minister in the 70s in New Zealand, when I was working with a church, I, I was in a place called Dunedin, I thought that the, um, the people were, I would go and visit them for seven years when I became a minister. I was so keen, I didn't get married, I wanted to be like Paul, I wanted to be single, I was out every night, and I would go and visit people. I got tired after about five years of doing that when I suddenly woke up and realized that the people who were Christians were what they were doing, they weren't being true to, I was focused then upon the Great Commission, to go out and evangelizing and making disciples of other, Christi of other Christians or, or, or enhancing discipleship or creating uh, disciples through telling people about Jesus. At night, when they had not been in their jobs, or finished on their jobs, I used to think that they were doing things for God. And I realized after visiting Christians for five years, they weren't doing anything. They were just going home and then going through the motions. This is a generation ago. This is without all the internet and all the stuff that's there that says we're just crazy and all the things we have to do in society. We're crazy doing all these things, but are we being true to what it means to be a Christian? That's what I'm asking in terms of evangelism. Where is evangelism? Where is the worship that seeks not so much to create the self-esteem? Self that's, that's a byproduct, 
so to speak, in respect to it. But in terms of the focus of what it means to worship God, let alone worship God, not just in terms of Sunday, but in terms of how we live our lives in the week. So that, that I, I thought I'd just... I don't know what your ideas are on that. I'd be interested in anything that you could tell me. But just came out when I was reading Galatians 2, verse 19, and especially that, uh, that verb there that's used of, uh, I have been crucified with Christ, in respect to this book that I've been reading by um, Jonathan Wilson, Living Faithfully in a Fragmented World. Having said that, I just want to now just finally just go through, I just want to give, give you, as we get toward the end of our course, just keep giving you the big picture so that you don't lose sight of what we're doing in respect to the complexity of a material that you are dealing with on a weekly basis. The good news is that we're nearly there, just a, a, what less than a month to go. Um, I just want to remind you of some basic things regarding verbs and nouns. That's it. Um, uh, the principal parts, uh, which you, in my view, commit to memory. Commit to memory, certainly, of whatever your paradigm is. For me, it's luo, so it's luo, luso, elusa, future, aorist, active, leluca, um, uh, perfect, active, lelumai, perfect uh, and middle, passive, and eluthane, uh, aorist, passive. And uh, from that, you know all the elements that are important as you look out, the sigma that's there within the future tense and in, also in the aorist tense. The aorist tense also with the augment at the beginning, the reduplication of the consonant in the perfect, uh, and then the theta that's there in the aorist passive. All those elements to me are signs that I look at when I see a verb, especially a verb that I'm not familiar with, so that I can work it out to work back to what its form is and therefore being able to translate it. So I've mentioned what I call the, the regular verb, and then you have the, the verbs that are, um, uh, we learn them according to present, the present form, in other words, present stem, but the verbal stem is uh, slightly different. For example, uh, ballo, uh, it's got two lambdas in it, ballo, I throw, and so on. But the uh, form, the, we know that the present and the imperfect take the form of the present stem, a ballon, but the, the stem of the uh, future and the uh, and the uh, aorist is what it's the second it's going to be a, a verbal stem so it's um, a, a ballo the sigma drops out excuse me ballo the sigma drops out and then a ballon which is a second aorist form it takes the what the endings of the imperfect for the aorist form and then you still get the um, reduplication of the consonant. Um, uh, Bebleka, which would then be, um, you'd also recognize it by the kappa at the end as being perfect active. Beblaimai, same thing, the ending mai, and then the reduplication of the um, beta, which would tell you that it's perfect passive, and then then the same thing in terms of the uh, augment at the beginning, and then the theta would tell you. That's what, that's, that's what, those are ways that I immediately can recognize the form of a verb and work backwards. Even if I'm at that point, it's, very, it's not used very much in New Testament, so I'm not even familiar with it, I can work back from that. And then likewise, especially um, one of the difficult areas has been for many people, the participles of understanding the participles. Well, the first thing is to understand the form. Um, you know, luon, luusa, that us, that, that u element in, in, denotes to me that it's feminine. So. Uh, as well as the the um, uh, the stem on, so luon luusa luon luonta. That's how I've learned it. And then the middle and passive uh, participle from um, luo luomenos. That menos tells me that it's middle and passive from that standpoint. So whether it's the perfect middle and passive leluminos uh, aon uh, aorist passive participle, or what are you going to see? Well, you. No, you know that theta is going to be in there. There's going to be no augment as, because it's, as a participle, because it doesn't necessarily um, relate to what's um, uh, what's previous, what's already happened. So therefore, uh, you learn the the ending, uh, which is what uh, luthes, um, luthesa, luthesen, luthenta, and so forth. So uh, it's those are two really important elements in terms of the principal parts and then the parts of the participle because we're now getting into a point where we're starting to um, work with uh, participles 
and they're very important. You know that, the uh, adjectival use of participle, where it's used as a sort of a definite article in a sense, uh, and so therefore is seen as uh, um, translated as a relative clause in respect to the main verb, or the adverbial use, which is uh, um, used in respect to a, a temporal or a causal element. Um, and the present um, uh, the present participle tense means uh, of a participle that's put in, say, as a relative clause, then in respect to the main verb, it's going to be action that's going on at the same time as the main verb, where an aer aorist participle, it will be action, usually, that occurs before the main verb. Those are just simple elements in respect to participles that, that w if you don't get too bogged down in terms of the pro proliferation of particles and just understand that, that's going to help you tremendously uh, as we go forward. So uh, the only other thing I just wanted to mention about verbs is just the basic notions of uh, verbs whose stem end in an uh, epsilon or an alpha or um, an omicron. Uh, what I call eto verbs, you, I just learn off the paradigms. Air er plus air er equals a, air er plus r er equals u, and air er plus a long vowel uh, drops out. Uh, same with the uh, eto verbs, a er plus r. Er equals O, A plus uh, S sound equals A, and A with a, with a vowel with, a, with a, an iota, excuse me, with an iota ends up as A with a iota subscript. And the same with O verbs, um, O plus a long vowel equals um, omega, O, uh, O plus a short vowel equals U, and O with iota in it is OI. Um, I just learn those off, and then I learn to recognize the verbs when I come across them, whether it's phileo and so forth, uh, in terms of an uh, eto verb. So the uh, only other thing I want to mention then is that's the big picture on verbs, and then the, then the sort of really big picture in respect to um, nouns is we've dealt with uh, first, second, and third declension nouns. First declension uh, nouns that end in an, uh, an eta, Agape, uh, agape, abacane, case, and so forth. You learn the paradigm. Likewise, that end in a vowel or rho. Uh, chimera, chimeran, chimera, chimera. And that's the first declension feminine noun. Then you've got first declension masculine noun. It's a bit unusual. Prophet taste is my paradigm that I learned there with a, that um, a eta and sigma at the end, profitane, profitais, profite, profite, and so forth. And then the, the, then the plural, profitai, profitas, and so forth. In other words, there's the alpha that's there that, that seems to throw it. But so in other words, what I've done is I've said first declension, there's um, feminine nouns and there's masculine nouns. You know in second declension, masculine nouns, we've learned that, like logos, uh, logos, logon, lagu, lago, that's how I've learned it, etc. And then second declension, neuter nouns, um, my paradigm there's ergon, in other words, that omicron and that nu tell me that it's, uh, it's neuter, second declension. And then the third declension nouns, you, you learn as you go along, I think. Uh, and I learned, uh, I think as uh, man says, you learn them uh, from the from the dictionary as well as you learn the genitive as well as the nominative singular. So aster, asteros, uh, uh, soma, somatos, soma, uh, soma, somatos, somati, somata, somata, somatan, somatas, somatone, somasin, and so forth. Well, that's how we do it in terms of the, the just the general nature of then we've only got three declensions so invariably if you've got a ver if you've got a noun that you see that looks really unfamiliar it's probably going to be third declension it's a question of when working back to that adjectives basically follow the same in other words first and second declension adjectives follow the, that that um, uh, os a on agathos agathe agathon or hagios in other words the ending of vowel or a row hagios agia agion um, and then uh, the ones that I've always thought useful too, to just to bring to your mind, are uh, demonstrative adjectives, ekanos, aon, uh, that, in other words, ekanos, ekanos is that one, whereas hutos, hote, uta, that is um, this one. It's, it's important to get the distinction between those, as it is between the, uh, not so much perhaps here with the personal pronouns, uh, I, uh, you, uh, ego, emi, emu, emoi. Uh, and su says su so, um, because we come across them so many times, usually in their um, uh, plural form, humes or uh, or uh, in respect to our and your and so on. Uh, 
Uh, third declension adjectives, again, a bit more difficult. Probably to learn the learn I would learn off the regular excuse me the ones that used over much many uh, polus pole polu and so on or uh, megas megale uh, mega um, that's uh, important in respect to that the other thing is the prepositions I'm just going to throw you can see it here's this great paradigm that you can just look at this with the prepositions I think that they they're relatively easy the most difficult thing with prepositions is to learn the two forms where a preposition is used with the accusative or with the genitive um, dear meaning because of or through depending whether it's used with uh, accusative or with genitive in respect to that um, and then finally I can tie this in now with what I said right at the beginning when it was my theological problem is you now know what ichthus means, right? So uh, ichthus, meaning fish, which is what? If I said to you, it, it's not a first declension noun, is it? It doesn't look second. It's a third declension noun. All right. Um, similar to, similarly to uh, polus and so forth. So uh, ichthus, uh, Jesus, Christos, theos, um, what? Huios and soter. And I've noticed that I've, I'm throwing up here the American fish, which basically goes back to what I was saying earlier in terms of the fragmentation of our understanding of theology, i.e. the cross, is such that we interpret who we are by our national state of what it means to be a human being living within the confines of a state. And therefore, we will never go against whatever the state really wants because that's how we live. We know that in terms of consumerism. We know that in terms of jingoism, of patriotism, and so on. We know that in terms of just the uh, element of uh, what I'd call civic religion. When the president ends a, whatever he's saying to the State of the Union address or uh, whatever he's saying, he's going to say, God bless America, which I, I don't think that means anything in respect to what we understand the gospel. It's basically a civic notion of what it means to be a good person which is part of the fragmentation that I think that Alistair McIntyre was talking about. Uh, that's a lot of material I've given you. I, I hope that that uh, can, uh, helps you and stimulates you as we get towards the end of our course. Again, if you have difficulties, please contact me. All right, thanks.